and David, uh, you always say the nicest things about me. I <laughs> wish I could have my wife listen in just to hear <laughs> the nice things that you say. Um, uh, you're, you're, you have a gift of encouragement and I'm, I'm delighted by it. Um, you, uh, you know that Father Sean also has six kids and you're going to have your six next, this coming month, aren't you? Yes. I mean, we've had six a couple of times with our foster care situation. So right now it'll be seven in the house, but you know, who's counting and only Sean views it as a competition anyway. So um, and, and I apologize to you all. I'm not as cool as Sean McCain is. I think he is super cool. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the risk we run of working alongside really great people like Ken and David. Um, you just, we just don't compare. So, but, um, Ken and David asked me to teach on apprenticeship. And so we're supposed to spend a couple of hours together. The way that I kind of blocked off the time is that we would uh, talk about um, apprenticeship and uh, the passing the baton book briefly for the next hour, and then go into a small group discussion time um, with some questions uh, for a half hour. It's hard for me to say exactly what time because we're all in different time zones and I don't want to confuse you. Um, so, um, and, and then we take a 30 minute break and then we come back together again. Um, so I'll try to guide you through that, but th the entire block of time I've been given is not all um, listening to me. Uh, my children don't do it, and so I, I wouldn't expect anybody else to listen to me for that long or even a portion of that time. So um, the book, uh, Passing the Baton, just a, a brief word about it. The topic is great. Some of the stuff in there is great. The writing is terrible. I don't know if you experienced that. The author just is not a very good writer. Um, and so some of it feels a little difficult to get through just because the writing isn't very good or exciting. Um, so my apologies for that, but um, the content itself, the need for uh, building or raising up people to work alongside us who may eventually you know, uh, receive the passing of the baton, um, I mean, we're not going to be doing this for the forever. And, uh, and at some point, uh, some of you will retire um, from your role um, from ministry and I don't know, sip margaritas on the beach for the rest of your life. But somebody's got to pick up where you where you put it down. And, uh, and we want uh, folks to uh, experience the joy of doing the ministry. A lot of the ministry that we do is a lot of fun. A lot of it's not very fun. Um, you know, the whole task of serving, being servants, um, includes a lot of tasks that we don't really enjoy that much, but um, we do them anyway because they're needed and they're necessary in the kingdom of God. And so um, we serve like Jesus with the basin and the towel, like Martha, um, and we just get busy um, doing a lot of the work, but it becomes a lot more fun when we invite others to come alongside us. So I don't know um, how you all experienced getting into ministry, um, whether there was a, I'm sure each of you has a different story about um, who inspired you, who invited you to uh, participate in certain ways, um, and whether there were meaningful friendships along the way. But for me, um, my most significant relationships were part of my getting involved in ministry. And I learned a lot through sort of shadowing and um, rolling up my sleeves alongside really gifted ministers. Um, the first clergy person who ever took an interest in me was a deacon by the name of Phil. He had a heart for college students. That was 25 years ago. I know I might look a little green, but that was 25 years ago for me. And uh, he spent a lot of time investing in me and inviting me to explore my giftedness in the church, in the context of the church. And it set me on a course that changed my life forever. And as a result, I met my wife. Now we have the kids and, um, you know, I'm, I'm leading this, this parish of multiple congregations on the north side of Chicago using apprentices. So 
uh, the first thing I want to dive us into is you're going to need a Bible and you're going to need something to take notes on uh, because I'm going to ask you a few questions that then you'll want to have the answers ready for the small group discussion time. So if you don't have a Bible, go ahead and grab one. Um, and if you don't have something to take notes with, there will be points where um, you'll want to write down a few answers to a few questions for the small group. Um, the first question I always get with apprentices is where do you find them? How do you, how do you find these naive, eager, and willing people who don't know what they're getting, getting involved in, who, who have no idea what they're signing up for? Where do you find them? Um, and I, I want to start with Exodus chapter 15. We're going to start with this. There's this wonderful story. Um, in Exodus chapter 15, they're in the desert. They've crossed the Red Sea. They've experienced some challenge or are beginning to experience challenge, having just been delivered at the Red Sea by the hand of God. And they've watched Pharaoh and all of his chariots drown in the Red Sea. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Nan, would you be willing to read for us? It's going to be verses 22, and then we'll stop at 25 for a moment. So Exodus 15, 22 through 25. Yes. Okay. This is uh, the New King James. It's my Bible. So. so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and, and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. Wonderful. Um, the, uh, the first dilemma, I mean, this isn't the first time that the Israelites complain in the desert, uh, and it certainly isn't going to be the last time that they complain, but they are in need. Um, and you can't go for very long without water. Um, they're in need. They come upon what looks like water, but it's not drinkable. And they cry out to the Lord. But from the Lord's perspective, everything that they need is right there in front of them. You know, um, they just don't recognize the significance of what's in front of them. And so then the Lord, of course, gestures, points, speaks towards this dead wood. Perhaps it's a dead tree. It's something that has grown, you know, nearby the, these bitter waters. And uh, it is what they need in order to be able to drink. I, I don't know if Moses is even perhaps sitting on the log as he's praying to the Lord, mm -hmm. um, unaware of the significance of what's underneath him. It's the same with apprentices that all of the people that you need are right around you where you are. You just may not recognize the significance of the people that are around you. It's like we need um, kingdom eyes. Um, so often the disciples failed to see the significance of things. Jesus saw things differently. Um, he saw significance. He saw value where the disciples didn't. The example of the children um, that they barred from coming to Jesus. Um, they just didn't see the significance. Um, and Jesus did. And so we have to ask the Lord to show us the people right around us that might be wonderful partners, apprentices in ministry. Um, most people think you have to go somewhere to find them, um, but they may be all around you. Um, and uh, people that we perhaps have written off 
um, the Lord may be directing you to. Um, these are individuals that he has chosen. Uh, uh, remember how the Lord, through uh, the prophet Samuel, um, chose David, whom uh, he was the last person, anybody who, you know, was looking at all of the brothers, he's the last brother anyone would have chosen. Um, but the scriptures tell us that the Lord um, looks on the inward heart. And apprentices are so much about what's on the inside, how teachable they are, how humble they are, how willing uh, to learn from you, uh, the chemistry that you might have are all things that you may uh, not see visibly. You may just see um, other, you know, external characteristics or attributes that make you uh, exclude them just automatically. I do it as well. Um, but there are uh, resources, according to the scriptures, right under our noses. So um, that would be my first um, word about where do we find apprentices? Um, we have to pray and see them, uh, asking for kingdom eyes to see them. Um, a lot of us might look at, you know, the woods and, uh, and see all the beautiful trees. Um, but a, a master builder would look at the same woods and see all of the houses he could build with those trees. Um, all the furniture, everything. Um, when we look at people, do we just see lovely, beautiful people or do we see what those people might become? Are we able to see the potentiality of, of individuals around us? Um, so we pray for spiritual eyes. Um, there's this wonderful uh, word of invitation. Uh, the best book I've ever read on invitation really, um, and, and it's, it's so hard these days to refer you to a great book because of how many leaders in ministry have fallen in ministry, but I, I'm convinced that leaders falling in ministry don't eradicate the value of some of the things they have to teach us. And so this is a Bill Hybels book um, called Volunteer Revolution. And it really is about how to ask people to volunteer in the church. I, th I think our bishop does not like the word volunteer. I'm totally with him. Um, people serve the church. They don't volunteer like a, a charity organization. Um, but uh, there are right ways to invite people to serve and many ways to invite people to serve that will result in a lot of no's. Um, people will say no to a lot of the ways that we ask them to, to join us. And so it's a great book if you want to learn how to ask someone to join you in ministry that will not um, turn them away. Uh, a couple of examples. Um, if you tell them that if they join you, if they serve in some way, let's just say altar guild, would you join me in working with the altar guild? It's so easy, an idiot can do it, right? That communicates you're an idiot. That's why I've asked you. Um, so there are ways that we ask people that communicate the wrong message to them. Um, we try to make jobs sound easy so they'll say yes, but it actually has the opposite effect. People say no to the easy tasks. They want you to ask them to do something meaningful and challenging. And because you think there's something special about them, not I just need a warm body. Um, anyone will do. So I picked you. You know, it, it just communicates that you're nothing, you know? And so there are all these ways in the church that we try to invite people, recruit people to apprentice or to do any kind of task. And we actually shoot ourselves in the foot by the way we ask. Um, and Bill Hybel's book uh, asks you to appeal to their calling, their giftings, the significance of the task even just greeting at the door of the church is such a significant task 
for communicating the hospitality and love of God. It's the very first encounter. And so you would not ask, you know, a stoic Viking who is most of the time hangry to be your greeter. Um, because that's the first impression people have. And it's the first encounter they have with what they symbolically view as the presence of God, even if they're a non-believer. And so you appeal to their gifts, their smile, their warmth, their hospitality. And you talk about how important this job is, how people actually become saved because their first encounter at the church was a warm greeter. Um, I still have people to this day telling me about how their life has changed in the church after 20 years of being in the church because I was the greeter at the door when they first came. I still have people telling those stories. Um, now, I forgot a lot of people's names, and there's one or two stories out there about my asking people three or four times what their name was, but, you know, we're only human. Um, we forget people's names, but that's not the significant um, work that we do um, and should be remembered for. It's the warmth. So um, when we look at the way that Jesus invited the disciples, um, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. I mean, he, he cast not just a net, he cast a vision um, for what they could become. I don't know how appealing that was to the the disciples who were fishing at the time, um, there's a there's pretty good uh, bi biblical intertextual evidence that the disciples knew who Jesus was when he came down the banks of the Sea of Galilee, that they had already encountered him when he was baptized, um, and John the Baptist had beckoned towards Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, but there was this sense in which Jesus's simple invitation that appealed to the significance of the kingdom, um, you know, caused them to drop everything. Um, there's a way in which we can invite people to join us uh, that captures their imagination, that um, connects to a dream that they have. Um, the requests that we make actually ennoble people. It brings nobility to their lives. Just imagine if people aren't doing anything to help in the church or the community, what they're actually doing with their lives. A lot of people are actually watching Netflix and drinking wine. That is how they spend their evenings. That's like the majority of our culture. But after spending some time on Netflix, you kind of run to the end of interesting shows and then you're only watching half interesting shows. And unless you're desperate, you might even be watching um, not interesting shows at all. And these are people desperate for anything significant to do with their evenings. Um, and, and so like that's the competition. So one or two nights of Netflix and wine is great, but let's give them something to do with the other evenings of their week, or let's give them something to do with their Sundays uh, that isn't just consuming the church service like going to a concert. Um, there's this beautiful story. I, uh, it, it's about uh, a man who um, goes on a mission trip to China and comes across, uh, you know, one of those individuals on the side of the road selling wares, but his wares were birds in cages. And uh, it took a bit of translation for this missionary to find out why the man was selling birds. He thought they were for pets, um, but he watched a boy come up, buy one of the birds for something that was the equivalent of a nickel or a dime. And the boy takes the cage with the bird and walks, you know, a hundred yards to the edge of the road and simply opens the cage and lets the bird out. Um, and releases the bird into the wild. And the man is confused, the missionary is confused, and he, he's asking questions, trying to, with his broken Chinese, figure out what's happening. And it turns out that like, there's, there's a, a, a joy that the people have of simply releasing birds, um, letting them out of their cage and watching them fly away. Um, 
and uh, watching the excitement of the boy, seeing that this is the whole purpose of these birds. They weren't meant to be kept as pets in cages. They were, they were being released from their cages. They made this missionary feel like this is what we do with, with people that we invite to do ministry with us, um, that we become uh, dream releasers, uh, just like those birds, that we help people release their dreams into um, actual you know, existence. Uh, there are all kinds of things that Bill Hybels writes about that people long for in this life and their jobs that what they do for salary and pay does not satisfy. Um, I think of the image of Mr. Incredible in the first movie um, where he's doing the insurance adjusting. Do any of you have a job like that? He's a big muscular man squeezed into a tiny cubicle being forced to turn down the little old lady who has a legitimate claim that insurance should cover. And his boss is this imp who just comes in and berates him and verbally abuses this man who is a hero and can do great things. But he's living his life in this sort of rat race kind of experience, which is, I think, where most people live. They have jobs that do not tap into their potential and don't use their giftedness. And they just have to clock in and clock out. And they're longing for someone to come and to give them significance, to make an invitation to do something significant or meaningful. And, and that's what we want to do, because everyone wants to make a difference in the world. Um, the, uh, the last thing that I would say in this first section on finding apprentices is that um, uh, there's this uh, tendency for pastors, for deacons, um, to sort of see their role, their job as a little bit like um, Dick Van Dyke in um, Mary Poppins. Do you remember the one man band that he did? Um, it's actually still astonishing to go back and look at him and how, like my, my son was so amazed. He counted all of the instruments that Dick Van Dyke was wearing in order to be that one man band. And, and I've seen quite a few pastors lead their churches that way. Um, when I first came to my church as the, the rector, one of the, the lay missioners was leading his congregation like a one-man band. He was the worship leader, he was the preacher, and he was the officiant. Um, and it was like, you know, if he didn't try to get others to help him, it was all him up front. Um, and it was exhausting uh, week after week doing all of the roles all by himself. So we... we um, we want to see our base of leadership grow in the churches that we're serving in. Um, so if you, if you take sand and you pour it out on the top of a stool, what happens once the sand has covered the top of the stool? You can unmute yourself and answer. Just imagine for a moment, I've got unlimited sand and I'm pouring it out on a stool top. It just falls on the floor. It just eventually falls in the air. What shape does the sand take? It becomes a cone. It becomes a cone. And if it's a square stool, it's going to become a pyramid shape, right? Hmm. And so the base of that stool determines <clears throat> how many volunteers or helpers or partners you can have in the church. But what happens if you make the base of the stool larger? What happens to the shape of the sand? It, it evens out, I guess, wouldn't it? If you have a larger table, it's going to even out. Well, will the pyramid get bigger or will it get wider or what will happen? It's like a geometry test here. Sorry. When, when you're talking about the base of the stool, are you talking about the seat? The seat itself, yeah. The okay, base. Your, 
your, your bone's going to get larger, maybe right. not as high, but it's going to spread out. That's right. If you um, don't expand the base of the sand and keep pouring out more and more volunteers, what happens to them? You, you lose them, right? You can't contain them. You can't hold on to them. So in order to, to receive more apprentices or more volunteers or more servants in the church, you have to expand your leadership base, which means taking some of these wonderful servants, apprenticing them to the point that they actually join you in the ministry. They help expand your leadership base. So let's just say hypothetically, you decide there are three people in my church that I think would be wonderful. Um, and I would love to invest more in their lives and invite them into a kind of apprentice relationship with me. This is sort of like an internship or a, a fellow or a resident. There are all these wonderful words for these kinds of, of folks. You invite them into some kind of higher commitment than just greeting at the church on Sundays. And, um, and in exchange for serving in different ways, you're gonna spend some time with them and teach them how to uh, prep the credence table each Sunday and what the meaning of all of these things are. And maybe you'll teach them how to do something cool like thurifer without hitting the priest in the head um, and uh, dropping the coals on the carpet. Um, which are all things that have happened in the Diocese of Western Anglicans, but I won't name any names. Um, and so these people join you and you're now leading three apprentices um, in growing in their ministry and learning new skills. Uh, but eventually they're gonna kind of have mastery over those skills. Then they um, find three or four other folks to apprentice. Now you're supervising your three apprentices who are then supervising themselves three others or two others or four others, depending on their personality type. Your, your leadership base has expanded significantly. And these wonderful folks can do all kinds of things that you don't have time for, or they could do the things that you hate doing, right? Uh, depending on what they are. Uh, some things you can't completely hand off, but there are lots of tasks that we don't enjoy. I don't think apprentices should do all the tasks that, that you don't enjoy, but they should definitely display a servant heart where they are willing to do the tasks that you don't enjoy because there is no clergy role. There is no pastoral role. There is no leadership role in the church that does not have a percentage of unpleasant tasks. I mean, even the bishop's role, if anybody ever aspires to be a bishop is fraught with misery and conflict and battles and all kinds of issues. Like there are lots of unpleasant things that our bishops have to do for the kingdom of God. And so uh, if anybody uh, thinks in a silly way that, that being ordained to the diaconate, then the priesthood, then the bishopric is like, is like a, a promotion, uh, I'm sorry to say, but they're very wrong. It's it's almost increasing in your misery to some, some degree. Um, so uh, a wise person would want to stay away from those things. Um, so let's, let's move to uh, if you have an apprentice. Um, I actually think it's wise to do more than one apprentice at a time. So while you may think, I don't even know how I could get one, um, there is a lot of fruit that can be brought from having two or more apprentices at the same time because... If you have one apprentice, one, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, volunteer or assistant in your ministry, and you can call them anything. People love titles, deacon's assistant, clergy assistant, um, you know, grand pumbaa, whatever you want to call them. Um, we, we came up with all kinds of new volunteer roles at the, at the cathedral because there's all kinds of things that no one's ever done before that we needed people to do, like follow the clergy around with a clipboard and make sure they're where they need to be on time. Uh, get the clergy a bottle of water. All kinds of people volunteered to be clergy assistants at the church. They loved it. Um, they were afraid to tell the clergy what to do, but 
we had to keep training them. The clergy love to be told what to do. They're like herding cats. You know, I don't know if you've ever tried to line up a procession with more than three priests in it, um, but it, they don't listen very well. And so um, getting them all in the right order, getting them to hold the right objects, um, all of these things take a little corralling. And so just inventing a, a role called clergy assistant helped us on Sunday mornings tremendously, getting their body mic on, making sure they did their sound check, getting them to the door to greet visitors at the end of the service. They just needed to be sort of moved along because they didn't go where they were supposed to. Um, I'm not saying this is true about any of you, just the clergy that I've met here in, in the Midwest. So um, giving them titles and, and the, the delightful thing about having more than one is that one apprentice develops a relationship with you and it's a hierarchical relationship, right? You're the boss, they're the, the learner, um, and you can fire them anytime you want. That's um, the authority that you have. Even volunteers, we can fire volunteers, right? We tell them that they're doing a bad job and uh, they can't do this job anymore, or they have a moral failure and we have to remove them from some ministries because those are pastoral ministries and they need to be in a process of, of recovery from their moral failure. So we fire people all the time. Um, the basic one is you're simply not reliable. Um, so you don't show up three times in a row without calling me. I can't depend on you, so you're fired. Um, I don't actually say it like that, but um, so there's this hierarchical authority relationship. What apprentices really benefit from is the horizontal relationships with other apprentices. So they can talk together without fear of um, it reflecting badly on them. Um, and so that dynamic that you can create by simply inviting two people or more to join you in some way can really improve the experience for them. And they have friends, they, they, those people become their friends. Um, they confess to each other. They become accountability partners or whatever. Um, they really develop good relationships um, because they're working alongside each other and they're struggling alongside each other. Um, so that's, that, that would be my argument for a cohort strategy. If you, um, if you want to raise up apprentices, the cohort strategy I've found to be the most effective. You're not doubling or tripling your time. You're doubling or tripling the amount of time they're actually serving you. Um, so whatever time you spend with one apprentice, you should be spending with them together rather than individually. So my apprentices, they all meet me at the same time as a group. That's the one hour I give them every week. We talk about their tasks. We do um, you know, any kind of training that I think is helpful, like how do we respond to people who um, come to us with a crisis? How do we do Eucharist in the hospital? Um, they get training for various kinds of tasks and they get to process and debrief um, one of the beloved members of the church called them angrily and said ugly things. How do you debrief that with your, your apprentice? Um, people in the church are not perfect. Um, if you thought that they were, this is a helpful lesson. Um, they all have bad moments. Uh, this one leader in the church got really, really political um, in a Bible study. How do we respond or debrief that kind of thing? Um, so they're always wonderful experiences that they're having or bad experiences that need debriefing. And you can do that with them all together because what one is experiencing, the others can learn from. And so um, don't think in terms of I've got to meet with each one for an hour alone every week. Um, that would be doubling or tripling your time. But just spending the same amount of time with all of them together um, is super ideal. And if they're each giving you five hours a week or 10 hours a week, just to be an apprentice, uh, you know, three or four is 30 or 40 hours of non-paid volunteer work to do stuff that you don't like doing. Um, and then you can spend time doing some of the stuff you really dreamed about doing before you became a deacon that the tyranny, the urgent kept you from being able to do those things. So, um, Developing your apprentices um, is 
when you get apprentices for the first time, it is, um, uh, you can, the trust is, is a little low, right? You don't know what they can do unless you've had a relationship with them for a while. So let's just take some college student who's decided to accept your invitation to be uh, in a particular role in the church alongside you. Let's just say for the sake of imagination, you create this role called the deacon's assistant, right? And you ask two or three college students if they want to learn more about ministry by um, accepting this role as deacon's assistant, and you have two of them that are going to do stuff with you on Sunday morning, help you. You may put them in a robe. They may follow you around and hand you things um, and, and, and take care of some of the tasks. And you're going to share a lot of what you do on a Sunday service with these individuals. So you meet with them um, once a week. At the very beginning, you're not sure what they're able to do. You're starting, you're basically watching a lot of what they do. Are they listening to you? Are they showing up on time? Um, it's really helpful to um, encourage them a lot, even if they're relatively slow at learning their new tasks. Um, don't ask really good questions. Um, they need someone to believe in them for a period of time until you can determine this is not a good fit for this individual or they're doing so well, I wanna give them more. So one of the roles that we give to apprentices in the CHIRP is to coordinate all of the details of a service. They have a checklist. They make sure that everybody who's in the service has arrived, the reader, the prayers of the people person, the altar guild, the greeter, the bulletins. They make sure that everything is in place. The gospel book is where it's supposed to be. Um, and, and they do a lot to help you by taking care of all of those tasks every Sunday. Um, when they make mistakes, they need you to advocate for them, to believe in them, to encourage them, and to pick them back up. A lot of people, when they make mistakes, are actually generally harder on themselves than they ought to be. They feel like their mistakes are major uh, mistakes. Now, there have been a lot of mistakes in our church services. I don't know if you guys have ever had any mistakes. Some of you seem very impressive to me. But like one Sunday, the priest got up to the altar at communion. And during the um, doxology, he looked at the altar that had been set by the deacon. And he saw that there was no bread anywhere in any baskets, nothing. The table had been set with wine, chalice, the baskets that hold the bread. Now this is a church of 800 people. So there are lots of baskets of bread, but there was no bread in the basket. And the priest was like, what are we gonna do? So instead of um, the words that begin the Eucharistic liturgy, he walks in front of the altar and starts to tell a story about how the children every Christmas in his house look for the baby Jesus because the baby Jesus isn't in the manger. And that's the first thing they do on Christmas morning is find, it's a scavenger hunt to find the baby Jesus in the nativity and to put him in the nativity before they can open presents. And he said, that's similar to this morning. We don't have any bread in these baskets. There's no baby Jesus here. So we're just gonna sing a worship song, right? Cueing the musician until somebody in this church brings bread. I'll tell you the altar guild never messed up like that again. It was so embarrassing for the altar guilt because they ran to the store, grabbed some bread, and then ran up the aisle in front of the whole church to unwrap bread and to get it on the altar. Um, people make mistakes. Um, this one happened to be visible. Um, hopefully most of the mistakes we make are invisible. Like people don't know that anything bad ever happened. We've had the, the legs of the credence table collapse during the opening procession, right? With everything prepped and ready on the credence table. We've just had it collapse with the carafes of wine shattering and wine spilling everywhere. And we've had all kinds of funny things happen that are very visible in public. Some no fault of anyone. Others, a simple lapse in taking care of things. So you need to be able to put your apprentice back together again after they fall apart from a mistake that they've made or from an embarrassing situation, even if it's a big deal, um, like not getting bread on the altar 
in time for communion, holding the entire church hostage um, for uh, the duration of how long it takes to get, you know, pita bread or something um, up on the bread to consecrate, on the altar, I mean. Um, uh, at any point that you want to ask a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and just interrupt. Uh, Zoom makes it a little hard for discussion, but we will have some discussion time in a moment. Um, what, uh, not just our faults and our failures and our mistakes, what does Jesus see when he, do you remember the story of the paralytic who was brought by his four friends they climb up on the roof, they break open the hole in the roof and they lower him down on a mat. So everybody, if you're in the room, you see all kinds of things, right? Destruction of private property, lots of dust being stirred up and your allergies kicking in. Um, uh, five people who just couldn't get here on time. I don't know what you see, but what did Jesus see when he looked at these four faces uh, looking through the roof as they're lowering this paralyzed friend down in front of the crowd and in front of Jesus in this house. What does Jesus see? You'll have to unmute yourself if you wanna respond. Go I ahead, think Anne. He saw compassionate people trying to get help for their friend or for yeah. someone that they maybe it was someone they just met but they decided to get that person to jesus yeah so i mean certainly what does he see in the faces of those four friends what does he recognize there gail well they're tenacious i mean oh. went, you know went up creative um persistent um and i think he sees faith also i think he sees faith too um mm -hmm. I, I think it's even in the passage, he, um, he says something about their faith um, and, uh, and, and that he is his, and, and he also sees in that man who's paralyzed, his greatest need. Do you remember what his greatest need was that Jesus addressed right away? It's okay. If you want to answer Canon David, you can. I know you're sitting on your hands. I, I'm trying to sit on my hands. It's, um, it's forgiveness. Yeah. yeah, he that's he, what Jesus offers him first. Yeah. And then of course everybody's shocked and they're like, who is this that forgives sins? And he says, to show you that I have the authority to forgive sins, um, rise up and walk. And uh, and the paralyzed man gets up. So his greatest need wasn't to have his paralysis healed, but his sins forgiven. And so um Jesus sees so much in this scenario that perhaps the people there or even we would miss um, uh, the, the, the potentiality of these friends and what they were capable of doing. I, I, I know it's not in the scriptures, but can you imagine what Jesus might have given them as an assignment after this event? Like these are four faithful, believing friends. I imagine, I mean, if I were Jesus, I would have an assignment for these four and I would send them somewhere to do something really important because they have impressed me. Um, I'm sure they impressed Jesus with what they did. Um, and so when you release an apprentice to try to do something, to get something off the ground, let's just say uh, they're going to do something special for the Easter Sunday service or for Good Friday service. They're going to take a risk and do something um, special, uh, a memorized scripture reading or a special visual banner set up or art display or something creative and special that's aligned with their gifts. And, and they try to get something off the ground. Um, it may or may not work well. Um, but think about how you will need to respond with both encouragement, affirmation, but also reassurance. Um, uh, everything that you do, everything that we do is in its worst version the first time we do it. I mean, hopefully, anything that we do more than once, the first time we did it was the worst version. And so you're inviting your apprentices to do the worst version they'll ever do when they do something they've never done before. And then hopefully, 
the second time, third time, fourth time they do it, it'll get a lot better. Um, and so we have to be there for them at their worst version of whatever it is they're trying to get off the ground. Um, go ahead, Canon David. Father Keith, does that apply to raising kids, by the way? <laughs> uh, I've heard rumor that it does actually apply to kids too. But I've also heard that parents put in their best effort up front and then by kid number six, we'll have to ask Sean McCain this. They're just not parenting anymore. Um, so maybe it's backwards for parenting. I don't know. Um, but thanks for being snarky. <laughs> um, okay, so does anybody know who uh, George de Mestral is? Um, he's famous for something, although his name may not be famous. He's a famous inventor. All right, so I'll start to give you some hints. Let me know when you know what he invented. He is a man, an ordinary man, who takes his dog for a walk. In his dog walking experience, he discovers that several of a, of a particular item have affixed themselves to his dog's coat. And he gets down on his knees. Go ahead, Gretchen, if you know it, you just go ahead and shout it out. Um, he gets on his knees to extract these little items from his dog's coat, and they're quite sticky. Um, they stick really well to the fur of the dog's coat. He pulls them off, he looks at them closely, and then he invents an item that you use in your everyday life. Post-it notes? No. Good guess though, Gail. No broke. Say again, Jerry. Velcro. You got it. It's Velcro. Oh, jeez. You got it. He uh, he was imitating the burrs that were fixed to the dog's coat. Okay, so now most of you, if you uh, were in this man's place, would you have seen any value in these burrs or would you have seen complete annoyance in your life? Right? They stick to my kids' legs and their boots and their everything. I mean, they stick to everything. Yeah. Um, they're totally annoying, but George saw this incredible value so much so that I don't know, I don't know if he got rich. He should have because Velcro is now an everyday item that we use. We use it to put our banners up in the church for crying out loud. Um, so like we use them in the sanctuary, um, Velcro. And so leaders who have apprentices, they see value in things. Um, they see value in things. Um, they look for evidence of God's presence in those that are around us. So when Jesus looks at James and John and Andrew and Peter, the four fishermen, when he initially invited them, he saw value in them. I'm sure if he looked at these four friends of the paralytic man, he saw a certain kind of value for the kingdom of God and invited them also to do something. Um, so we have to see value in the people around us and what they're, they might be capable of doing for the kingdom of God. This is really a great opportunity for us to identify artists in the church, people who are creative, people who want to do something different or that has never been done before in worship. And we can have a response of this is the way we've always done it. We will not change how we do things, but that will not encourage and release artists. There are so many things that we can do differently that do not jeopardize our liturgy or our worship experience or our traditions. Um, There's so many creative, fun, new things that we can implement, but only the artists are gonna think of these fun new ways of doing different things. Gail, did you wanna say something? I was just wondering if Canon David was squirming when you were saying that. <laughs> Yeah, what do you think of artists in the church, David? Hey, I'm all for it. Um, I, I, I think that's a really good idea. Um, there's just so many places, as you said, for stuff. Yeah. So one of the artists in our church um, wanted to do something different for the banners for Lent this year. You know, every year we're always trying to figure out how do you convey Lent through the visuals in the church and the sanctuary itself? And, you know, the color of Lent is purple, right? 
But we were doing this, um, we wanted to do a healing theme in Lent because we wanted our church to grow in their willingness to receive prayer and to respond to the work of God in their lives. And so uh, we wanted to do a, a themed Lent this year using the lectionary, but on the theme of transformation. Um, so like the first passage in Lent was the great commandment to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors ourself. So that Sunday, we focused on disordered loves and how we could be transformed in our loves um, so that we can love God with our whole heart, mind, and soul. So transformation was the theme. So what did the visual artists do with our banners? They did, uh, we have these uh, high ceilings and we made a way to hang fabric from the top of the, the, the frame uh, above the altar. And so um, one side, they did three colors of like uh, cranberry, uh, 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 a red, maybe like a maroon, a cranberry and a purple. And uh, they had those hang down and then fall on the corner of the altar into a, a pot in the center. And then on the other side, they did a bright blue, a navy and a purple and had it come down onto the altar and then uh, cascading into that pot. And they put dead sticks in the pot. And so the, the people picked up on what this was right away. It was the outpouring of water and wine um, in the altar, falling on the altar into the front of the altar, into a pot of dead sticks. And then the artist had taken one green leaf and one purple flower and put it in the dead sticks, communicating that there's this transformation of water to wine, right? The, the miracle in Cana, um, which also symbolizes the human and the divine in Jesus as the water and the wine pours out from his side. And the dead sticks are suddenly become, like, coming alive um, in this transformation process. This transformation from water into wine brings new life. And the artist nailed it. And everybody who's come into the church has loved it. And they haven't messed anything up that we normally do. Um, with this uh, banner display that uh, is super creative and super powerful. But who would have thought of it? I mean, certainly the clergy don't have time to think too much about this sort of thing. Um, and I don't know about you, but some of our priests aren't very creative. Um, no offense, Ken and David. Um, so like we need creative people to think of these new fresh ways of conveying what God wants us to focus on in Lent uh, to the church. And we can do the same thing with Easter tide or Advent. Yes, Gail. I was going to say just amen to what you're saying, because it takes all types to reach all types. And um, so a creative type person is going to reach another creative type person. I might not reach that person with my gifts, but, but that will draw in the people that are attracted to that and, and appreciate that. Yep. You're absolutely right. Um, Father Keith, um, I want to just connect our people with some of the stuff that Sean said this morning, Father Sean, uh, about, about culture and symbols and, and things. So, so this, is, this is an illustration, a uh, very concrete illustration of some of the things that Father Sean was talking about in the liturgy. Um, and uh, again, I said this would be kind of a in some ways an application of some of the things we saw this morning. And this is, this is a really good application. What, what, are, what are people seeing who come in and see this? And how does this make the liturgy missional? Or, or let me turn it around. How does this uh, make the missional value of the liturgy more apparent? Yeah. Yeah, I honestly believe that the more we can release artists in the church, the more the lost will connect um, because uh, the, the nature of the great tradition and our way of worship is to appeal to all of the senses, um, the five senses, to engage the whole person in worship. But a lot of our services have, have not really engaged all five senses in a new way each Sunday. Um, and so we can bring newness um, in how people are impacted. And so anything creative or new or uh, interesting that our artists, I mean, the, the nature of the artist is to capture something true that they can 
uh, observe and they see the world and they see God's love in a, in a unique way. And then they find these creative ways of communicating those things um, to people who are, uh, that, that touch people in their desires and their longings. And so um, the most evangelistic service of the year in, in our diocese is our Easter vigil because we release the artists more at the Easter vigil than any other service of the year. And so can you imagine an Easter vigil that draws all of your lost people? And, and can you imagine at some point going around the sanctuary and asking everybody when they first attended and to hear more than half of them say their first time visiting the church was the vigil at Easter? I don't know if your vigil, uh, you know, it has that kind of experience or, you know, that, that it has that, that reputation, but imagine if it did. Um, so uh, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention before we go to our, our small groups for discussion is um, with apprentices, we want to focus on their gifts, not just what the church needs them to do. Um, and there are gifts that everyone has. Um, and so I, if, you, if you've never done a gift inventory, it's really good to find one that you like. All of them are, are not perfect. Some of them are more charismatic. Some of them ignore the charismatic gifts. Um, you know, there's so many different kinds of spiritual gift inventories. They're only meant to start conversations with people about what they think they might be gifted by God to do. Um, the test isn't supposed to diagnose them accurately. It's just supposed to start conversations because some of the words, the questions are worded badly, poorly. Some of them are worded well. That doesn't matter. It's just about getting that conversation going about what are you gifted in? What do you love to do? And then finding ways for them to use their gifts. And a lot of the gifts of our apprentices aren't fulfilled in the sanctuary. They're fulfilled outside the four walls of the church. They're gifts of evangelism, mission, serving the poor, talking to strangers, um, those family gatherings that draw neighbors in, uh, events around the calendar, like neighborhood block parties when the weather is great. This is where a lot of people's gifts are actually oriented. And, and when you discover that, it means that God is answering your prayer to raise up more laborers for the harvest. He's bringing apprentices to you that are gifted in harvest gifts. But because they aren't things that we're doing on a regular basis, it's kind of hard to figure out how to use them, how to release them in this um, mission-oriented work. And so um, it is helpful to get people who are gifted in sort of uh, mercy, compassion, mission to get them together. Because when they get together, they come up with some great ideas. And they kind of they're kind of annoying at my church. They keep bringing more ideas to me and it's like more than I can handle, um, but it's so good. And we've got to find ways for them. So like most recently, they, they um, Chicago gets really, really cold. I don't know if you've heard. Um, anybody in their right mind would move to San Diego. But in Chicago, there are a lot of people who are still on the streets and homeless during the worst of the winters here. And we're talking below zero, uh, negative five, negative eight. And so uh, um, our, our compassion apprentices, they, they got these, you know, those hot ramen cups that you just pour hot water in and, uh, and it, like there's no cooking involved. Um, they're also super cheap. Um, they just got a bunch of those and hot water and went out on the streets to serve those to people, just pouring the water into those and handing them out. Um, and that was an incredible outreach. And it was so simple and inexpensive. And it was an idea of some 22 year old in our church. Like we made feeding the, the poor and serving those who are cold really complicated. And this 22 year old came along and made it really simple. Um, I, I just couldn't believe it. And so that was a huge hit and 30% and of the church signed up to go out and to serve 
the, this, these ramen cups and hot cocoa to the people on the street under the bridges in Chicago in the city. Um, it was astonishing. So we've got to recognize their gifts and help them find ways to use their gifts, even if it doesn't exist yet in, in the church. Whatever it is that they were made to do doesn't yet exist in the church. We've got to help them find that. Um, and some of it means taking risks, doing something that's never been done before, trial and error. We are not going to um, grow the kingdom of God by playing it safe um, and by staying in our comfort zones and um, not taking any risks. Um, we take risks all the time in our lives. We take risks when we get married. You took a risk when you got ordained to the diaconate. We take risks when we buy a house and we invest in a stock or a mutual fund. We take risks when we get on an airplane or in a car. Why not take a risk for the kingdom of God? We're used to taking risks, but at times in the kingdom of God, we play it too safe. And, and, and uh, that's going to lead us into our small group time. Um, here are two questions I want you to try to answer and share in your small group time. Um, one, I'd like you to list three dreams that you've had. They can be kingdom of God oriented or totally not kingdom of God oriented. Three dreams that you've had. And I'm not talking like the dream you have at night. I'm talking about like something you've always wanted to do or something you've always wanted to see happen. Like for me, I've always wanted to visit Jerusalem and I've always wanted to visit Rome. Um, those are dreams that I have. I also want to own a private tropical island one day, but that's not going to happen. Um, thanks for laughing, David. Three dreams that you have tucked away in your heart that have not yet come true, right? So if they've already come true, that uh, think of three that have not come true. And I'd like you to share those three dreams that you've tucked away in your heart in your group. And then the second question is, what are some of the greatest fears that people have about getting involved in ministry, period? Three, try to name three. Three of the, this is three for you to name and write down and then to share in your group, not three total for your group to come up with. What are three of the greatest fears that keep people from getting involved in ministry? And I'd love the small group time to go for a half hour. And I know I've gone over a little bit because I didn't plan for the, the, um, the daily office prayer time. That was my bad. So I'd like to go um, for, for um, let's say 20, 20 minutes in a small group time. No, let's go 25 minutes and then after the small group time is actually a break, uh, a 30 minute break. Um, so let's make it a, let's make it a 25 minute small group time and a 25 minute break. Does that sound okay? And then we'll come back together again at the top of the hour. Um, my time will be five. Your time will be four mountain and 3 PM Pacific, right? When we come back together again. All right. Um, does Jenna do the breakouts? I can do them or you can do them. It's up to you. Oh, how do I do them? Um, I've never done that before. Do you see? Oh, well, then I'll do it. It's fine. Unless okay. you want to learn something new. It's up People to think you. I'm young you should and apprentice and in Jenna. Yeah, apprentice in Jenna. Apprentice him on how to do it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Is it under participants? It's under breakouts down at the bottom, breakout oh, rooms. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of just plug people into whichever room, but I, I'm not going to a room. I don't know if Ken and David will go to a room. Yeah. I, I enjoy discussion. So put me in a room. Am and then, I doing that? And then you just click on open all rooms when you've got everybody in the room. So where, where do you see everybody? Sorry. Okay, click on the little a carrot down next to a room, and then you just have to assign. Okay. See, see over to the right, it says assign. Oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Uh-huh. 
So You're doing talented. such a great job. You're so talented. Oh, <laughs> love it. And then, and, and the Lord loves you so much, especially <laughs> if you came to San Diego. So then what we would do is you just click on the name of the people you want to go into whichever rooms. So there's three right now. Okay. Um, this is great. Almost done. You can okay. always add a room. Three groups of three. Perfect. Right? And then uh, click open exactly. all rooms. And then click open all rooms. All right. All right, you guys, I'll see you in a bit. Have fun. That's perfect. You did it. All right. Perfect. 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 I'm going to go get food because I haven't eaten today. So um, at all? Not at all. Yeah. I'm, oh I'm not good at that sort of thing, feeding myself. So, you know, I used to be able to go to about this time, but then lately I was getting, I got out of that. And um, so now I was, I'm eating. Well, I mean, today I had to eat at like noon or whatever, because I knew I wasn't going to get much of a break. So it's amazing how you organize everything that this diocese does. I'm just so stunned by how it's many only, events you organize. It's only by the grace of God. I'll be honest. That I mean, that's the only thing. I was almost in tears a couple. Was it this week? I have been in tears a couple of times this week. It's just too much. Yeah. And, you know, you know I mean, again, I wouldn't, I'm not complaining necessarily about the, the job because Bishop works harder than I do. Um, but it's being recorded, by the way, just so you know, I should stop that. If I ever had, um, his name is Deacon Kyle Ash. Um, and he is in the city of Chicago right now. Um, and he's going to join us for the next hour. We're going to interview him. Um, but one of the things that your conversation, John was, was making me realize is I don't know where everybody is at in the world right now on this call. So I'd love to by, by means of introducing to Kyle, all of you wonderful people, um, where you're at, I, I would like to, uh, Kyle, introduce you to Canon David Montzingo. Um, he is in San Diego. He is the Canon of Clergy Formation, or some people have called him the Canon Theologian of the Diocese of Western Anglican. So he is the boss of this call. If we get out of line, he sends you a private message to tell you to get back in line. Uh, from whatever crazy thing you just said. So um, uh, would you guys be willing to go around and, and say who you are and where you're from so that Kyle can get a sense of um, the spread of this wonderful group of deacons? I'll start. Kyle, I'm Jerry Duplansky, and I'm from Christ Church in Fallbrook, California. Uh, and that's in the San, North San Diego County. I don't live in San Diego County. I live in Riverside County in an area called Lake Elsinore, about 30 minutes north of my church, about an hour and 15 minutes north of downtown San Diego. Gretchen Knapp, Billings, Montana. Billings, Montana. Yep. It's awesome. I'm uh, Nan Joyce, and I'm in Butte, Montana. And, and it's cold here. <laughs> uh, and believe it or not, I don't know what I've you been, guys consider cold. It's like thirty degrees at our house, and I don't. It are, I don't think that's cold. Hi, <laughs> girl. Uh, I'm John Leggett, and I'm in Phoenix, and it's cold here. It's in the low sixties. We're suffering silently here. <laughs> here. I'm Gail Duffy, and I'm in my backyard in San Diego. Nah. This is not a virtual background anymore, people. The real <laughs> There's snow in our backyard. <laughs> I'm Diane Charles, oh, and I'm in Burbank, California. Burbank. Are, what, what church are you with, Diane? I'm with St. David's Anglican Church in okay. Burbank. So is that where Astor is now? Yes, it is where Father Astor has become rector and priest. Awesome. And we are is extremely Spencer, blessed to have him. Is Spencer still haunting the halls of that church? 
Uh, well, we do live stream. We haven't been meeting in person, so uh, I believe he's been joining our live stream, but it's been a while since I've seen him, actually. Oh, but yeah. he, he's still a gonna, part of us. I was trying to make fun of him just a little bit there, so. <laughs> uh, okay, who, who do we still have? Steve and John Jordan. John Jordan. Um, I'm uh, a deacon. And uh, we're in a new church plant by the name of St. Martin's in um, northwest uh, Las Vegas. Um, Father Paul Nason is the pastor. Right. And then Steve. Uh, Steve Barber in La Mirada, California, uh, attending ACE, the Anglican Church of the Epiphany. Right. Awesome. So we're spread over three time zones um, on this call. And Kyle Ash, he uh, he did his MDiv at Fuller. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Anything about that wonderful part of the country? No. Yeah. So I was going to say some of these place names you guys are saying, La Mirada and Riverside County. I mean, those were my backyard in Pasadena for a while. So it's bringing up good memories. Also, some of you, um, like, for example, um, I think it was Nan in Butte, Montana. I've been in Butte in February, actually. I worked for the Veritas Forum, a nonprofit, and I was there uh, in February. And uh, it is very cold. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> good to meet you, Kyle. Good to meet you all. Yeah, thanks for having me on tonight. It's good to meet you all. Kyle is um, my, like right now, my uh, number one apprentice, but I, I would just say he's my favorite of all the men and women that I've apprenticed, apprenticed over the years. And so I'd love for Kyle just to say a little bit of what he experienced um, when he first came to our church, having just moved mm -hmm. to the neighborhood called Portage Park in the city of Chicago. And uh, he visited our church, which was on a Sunday afternoon at the time. I believe it was a 3.30 p.m. Sunday afternoon service in mm -hmm. renting space in a Lutheran church. Yeah. Yeah, so um, part of my journey is that while I was at Fuller is actually when I became introduced to the Anglican Church in North America. Prior to that, I um, had grown up Baptist and had served previously in a non-denominational setting. Um, I'm from the St. Louis, Missouri area originally, so it was in that area where my ministry was um, focused at that time. Went away to Fuller with my wife, um, and when we moved to the Chicago area, we our story intersected with Church of the Resurrection uh, in Wheaton, which is the cathedral of our diocese, um, and we were there for about six months um, before moving into the city itself, the city limits of Chicago. Um, and uh, yeah, so we were anxious to find another church that was connected with the diocese. We had a wonderful experience with Church of the Resurrection. And it turned out that there was this congregation that had begun meeting literally weeks before we moved to Portage Park, the congregation moved to the neighborhood of Portage Park as well. And so um, we had some, I had some mutual friends, Natalie and I did, um, with Father Keith, and he got tipped off that we were coming from what I understand. And so the very first Sunday that we show up, we're thinking we're visitors here, this is going to be great, we'll just kind of check it out and see what this church is like. We uh, Father Keith made a point to introduce himself to us and us to him, and then he invited us the very first week into the prayer circle for all the leaders that were going to be leading the service. And we were like, wait a second, we're just here, we're just checking this church out, right? Um, and so in a weird way, it's he invited me into the leadership circle early, and I sort of never left, I think, in some ways. And so um, part of my experience really with uh, what was then Redeemer Anglican Church and now Cornerstone Anglican Church was this sense that um, uh, uh, leaders would be, we, we seek to raise up and release leaders early into leadership to let them kind of try their gifts and, and to, and in sort of, you know, measured ways and, you know, not like, uh, you, you want to know someone. He was fortunate to have, uh, these friends knew us pretty well. And so I think he kind of had a sense for who we were before he even knew us. Um, and so, but, but that's part of our culture at the church. And so 
Um, yeah, I don't know if that speaks a little bit to what you were um, thinking of, Keith, but that was my initial experience with uh, our congregation at that time. Oh, your reputation preceded you, um, as it were. And it was a very positive reputation, of course. So, um, uh, Kyle, how would you describe what it was like um, sort of being invited into uh, various leadership roles in the church mm -hmm. um, as a, as a, you know, a, a picture of apprenticeship? Yeah, well, it's crucial. <laughs> like, um, I, um, I was thinking even today about you know, when Jesus in the gospel sends out the 72 um, and he sends them out to do the things that he was doing. They got their own like reps on the things that um, he was wanting them to grow into being able to do, right? And so I, I think that in any ministry context, it's crucial to be able to identify people who you see as, I think this person could be raised up into being able to do this thing that we do, right? And so for me, it was really crucial to my own uh, sense of, of calling in that season. I was working bivocationally at the time, as I said, with the Veritas Forum. I mentioned that earlier. Um, and it was crucial for continuing to test and affirm the call to serve pastorally in our context um, in that season, and then obviously into the, the present as well. So what were some of the steps that you went through? Yeah, well, I mean, for part of it was um, it was us getting to know um, the congregation and Keith getting to know Natalie and me um, and sort of what we were all about together. And it, if um, even stepping into more leadership would be a fit, I think, in some ways. And so um, some of the earliest things I did was I, I um, Keith invited me to preach uh, within a few months of us first coming. Um, but when he did, you know, I submitted a draft to him in advance so that he could check it and vet it and, you know, kind of uh, have a sense for what, what I was actually going to say if when I, you know, uh, for the first time as a, as a preacher and as a pastor. Um, I also have a background in leading worship. And so um, I was able to first just kind of like play alongside of um, our other worship leader. And then also once it was clear, I would be able to kind of help fill in for him too. I started doing that more. Uh, he was a bivocational worship leader um, as well at that time. And so that was helpful to him. Um, and so it was, uh, some of it was just being able to um, receive invitations into things I kind of already um, had as experience was somewhat gifted at already. Um, but then, you know, as my um, uh, leadership grew as Keith handed off more leadership to me, it began to involve things that maybe weren't in my wheelhouse so much, right? So like it involved things or things that I hadn't had as much experience with in the past, things like helping to form budgets for the church alongside of Keith or helping to, um, yeah, work on some of the other kind of operations pieces that I hadn't had as much exposure to in the church before and him handing off pieces of that to me as well along the way and, and kind of walking me through those uh, so that I could get a sense for what those were like and helping me to um, uh, try my hand at them to see if I would take to them. And only Keith can know, I guess, of whether or not I've taken to those or not. But, uh, but that's the kind of opportunity he's offered. Um, so it's kind of starting with the, the known quantities in my gift mix and then starting to take, you know, kind of lily pad out from there into things that maybe weren't as clearly part of my gift mix or experience, but um, trying to incorporate those into my um, sort of ministry repertoire as well, I think. Um, uh, Kyle is a transitional deacon. Um, the, uh, what was the first leadership role you were invited into, Kyle? Man, I, I guess I don't. There's a right and a wrong answer here. Oh, oh, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. So for, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. So in terms of role, sorry if I misunderstood your question before. I was thinking of like kind of ministry opportunities you were mentioning. As far as role, for us, um, there is a lay pastor role called the catechist role that's really important to the culture of the churches that we are um, part of here in the Greenhouse Movement in Chicago. And so um, I was serving as a lay pastor bivocationally alongside of my work with the Veritas Forum. And so in that capacity, I was also uh, incorporating into my um, 
my rhythm of life, things like hosting a city group in my home and having congregants be there for that small group setting and uh, making pastoral visits in the hospital or elsewhere and exercising pastoral um, care as a lay pastor for our congregation, as a catechist for our congregation. So in the Diocese of Western Anglicans, this role is called the lay missioner. Okay. The lay missioner is uh, what uh, the, the diocese led by Canon Jesse Sandoval. He is the canon for lay missioners. And, um, and, and so basically Kyle was invited um, by the current leadership of the church to uh, be a lay missioner in the church and to do mission alongside the, uh, the ordained pastors. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I appreciate that, that comment that was um, shared by David Monzingo. Um, and, and so it's one of the things that captured uh, Bishop Keith's imagination. And he began to build that with Canon David and Canon Brian um, and the deans in the Diocese of Western Anglicans. So um, for Kyle, what, what, what did it, um, what process did you go through to become the lay missioner in the, in the church? Yeah, well, I mean, it, began with a season of discernment for you and for me uh, around, you know, whether that would be a fit from what I remember. And so um, it had to do with starting with your um, invitation in, to enter into discernment for that. And so uh, we prayed about it. And then as the congregation, you know, some of our leaders are um, what we call our parish council and others got to know um, me better than they entered into that discernment with us uh, to determine whether or not um, there was a call for me to enter into the the catechist the lay missioner role in that season and so all of us said yes to that and so um, uh, in the fall of 2017 then I was commissioned we do a commissioning um, I was commissioned as lay pastor at that point uh, in time and we do it such that every year we renew our sort of commitment in the commissioning to be a lay missioner uh, in our in our movement. So you were commissioned in the service as a lay missioner for one year. Were you mm -hmm. the only lay missioner commissioned? No, no, there was a second lay missioner at that point. Her name was Laura Nichol. Um, and she and I served together initially as uh, lay pastors, lay missioners uh, for our congregation at that point. That's great. Um, at, at any point you guys need clarifying questions, please feel free and ask. Um, but this uh, session is meant to be a, a, an interview of uh, a young man who's been apprenticed and has um, fully arrived at the pinnacle of ministry success. Oh gosh, by you're being, too on, Kyle, by being free with praise. By being ordained a deacon. So the deacons are the heroes, <laughs> right? And he's- really Amen to that, I'll give you that. <laughs> So, um, Kyle, how, how, um, what were some of the things that you did in the Sunday service as lay missioner, um, and what were you apprenticed to do in the service? Yeah, great question. Great question. Yeah. So, um, for me, uh, in my particular, in our particular church context, um, uh, oftentimes, um, so in our, is it okay? I'm just going to take a bird's eye for a second view of, of that question. So um, in our congregation, we are a congregation connected to others in a parish of multiple congregations. And Keith is our lead pastor for that parish of multiple congregations. And so the Portage Park neighborhood congregation is, if you will, sort of like the bishop's seat. It's like, you know, of that, of our particular parish. And so uh, Keith's presence is often at Portage Park. And so for me, often I would serve um, alongside of Keith on a Sunday morning in uh, a somewhat roughly equivalent role to a deacon, essentially, of, of um, helping with certain parts of the liturgy as assigned by Keith, um, setting the table in the absence of, a, of another deacon being ordained, that kind of thing. But um, also because Keith is 
his, his oversight is over other congregations, there are times when Keith would not be present in Portage Park. And in those scenarios, either Laura at that time or myself would actually step into uh, sort of the deacon's mass kind of role. And so we would lead the service as lay people with a, a modified liturgy, uh, already reserved sacramental um, elements um, and, and uh, you know, serve, lead the, officiate the liturgy um, in all those ways kind of thing. And so, um, so then Keith trained us and taught us how to lead from in that way. And uh, from time to time, we would, we would also serve in that way. Right. And so how long were you a lay missioner before the church started discerning your call to the transitional diaconate? Oh gosh. Well, <laughs> that's so when it started discerning, I feel like was uh, rel relatively early on, but I'd say the discernment actually picked up. I had been a lay missioner for probably about a year and a half, maybe. I don't know, Keith, you can correct me if you, I'm remembering the timeline incorrectly, but um, I would say we really started taking active steps forward uh, somewhere after a year into that role. Um, and, and then over the course of the next year, kind of actively, um, first discerned, and then I began my training for the diaconate with our canon theologian in the diocese, um, later kind of in that second year of, uh, I think is the way I'm remembering. Does that sound about right to you, Keith? Yeah. Um, yeah. so a year and a half as lay missionary, yep. um, yep. did the church pay you a dime? They paid me a dime. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I was stipended. I was stipended by the church uh, in, uh, uh, yep. <laughs> How much of your lay mission role were you stipended? How much of it? What do you mean by that question? Were you stipended from the beginning of your lay mission role? I was kind of hoping you'd say that oh, no. all, um, but, but now I've forgotten. Yeah. So good question. For the first year, I was not stipended for the role. And then because our finances increased and my response, I, you know, I, I actually wasn't part of, uh, you know, I didn't ask for it. I, Keith approached me and said in sort of uh, after that first year in sort of like honor of the, the um, ministry that you are doing, it's robust enough that we would like to offer you a small stipend for your ministry here. So in the second year, I was stipended for my lay mission yeah. role. Right. I had totally forgotten that. I was trying yep. to make the point for everybody that that these lovely people will step into these roles of significance and influence without being paid at all. Um, but well, that's true. I didn't think I was going to get compensated when I took it on. So, I mean, with American dollars, he didn't think he'd be compensated. <laughs> <laughs> he was compensated quite well with uh, affirmation from me and. Uh, like that's worth a lot, you know, affirmation for me. So it's true. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, then would you say that once you were ordained a deacon, that your role as an apprentice and learning um, from me or other priests came to an end and that you had arrived at the fullest extent of your diaconal knowledge? Well, in spite of the lofty, and appropriate praise you did give to the role of the diaconate earlier. Um, no, my learning did continue. I mean, um, I, I am fortunate to actually have very um, dedicated and wise and gifted clergy around me as well. And so, yeah, I was absolutely, and still am, as, a, as you, you know, uh, someone asked about the transitional diaconate. And so, of course, in this, in that kind of a context, uh, learning from the priests around me has been really crucial uh, for my continuing formation, uh, not only toward the priesthood, but but also as a deacon, as a deacon as well. So, and what do you think will be um, the sort of next several years trajectory for yourself? Oh, good question. Yeah, we're discerning that still, but um, right now, um, uh, again through uh, you know. Father Keith's support and encouragement of my own call and the call of my family. Um, we're actually, um, I'm taking active steps toward apprenticing into a lead pastor role so that I, at some point in the future, will uh, be a Keith 
for a parish of multiple congregations. Um, so that's the trajectory at this point that we're kind of on together. Do you and I have the same gifts? Some, but not all, not all, and but we do have would, some. How would you say that we're different? In our mm. Gift? Mm. That's a good question. Well, part of it might be temperament too. Um, no, no, no. I mean that in a, I mean that in a positive way. I just think I, like, so you are more, I think we're both very relational, but you're more extroverted in your relationality and I'm more introverted in my relationality. I, I get drained more quickly um, from sort of the bigger group and the, um, but, but it doesn't strike me that that's as easy for you necessarily. So um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, uh, and I would say too, uh, one of your main, like one of the just Keith Hartzell oozes uh, just kind of encouragement and infusing things with enthusiasm. He, he helps get the ball across the goal line for a lot of things because of the kind of uh, enthusiasm he pushes and pumps things into. And I don't, I don't have that same woo as they sometimes say uh, necessarily. And so, um, and so those are, those are different. I would say, um, I think both of us are more oriented into a shepherding uh, gift and have administrative gifts. Um, so is there, you know, there are parts that do have overlap, but there are certainly parts where we're different and we lead from different kind of gift mixes, uh, uh, you know, in the church. One of the, um, one of the things I wanted to emphasize <clears throat> as, a, as we apprentice people is that we're not in the business of creating mini me's mm. or getting our apprentices to be exactly like us, mm. um, imitating us and all of our, like, you know, to be exactly like us, like that's not um, uh, mm. what we are called to do. But a lot of leaders and pastors, that's what they do with the people that are following them. They try to shape them to be just like them and get them to stop doing the things that make them unique. And, 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 people are so different. We're not, we're not trying to create more of ourselves. We're trying to identify a person's gifts and help them to develop in their own giftedness and in their own calling. And so the last thing I want is for Kyle to be like me when he um, steps into his role as lead pastor of Cornerstone Anglican Church on the north side of the city of Chicago. I want him to lead with his own style his own giftings his own personality and and uh the kind of energy that that brings um or else he'll actually get drained trying to pretend to be someone he's not mm -hmm. and that's like i don't want mm. any of my apprentices to be sprinters i want them all to be marathon runners because the the, the just the statistics of people who start ministry in their 20s but are done and out of ministry by the time they hit the age of 30 is so high. Um, the burnout rate is just so high that like right from the beginning, no matter how young and youthful and energetic they are, I, I, I emphasize the self-care uh, 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 patterns uh, that, that ministers and pastors who have been in ministry their whole lives have to utilize. And, and Ken and David has such a passion for those healthy clergy self-care um, habits and routines uh, that we need to have. And so I don't want Kyle to be a sprinter. I don't want him to waste his energy being somebody he's not. He also has a beautiful family. His wife is amazing. And they have three gorgeous boys, um, all really little and super sweet. Um, and so he's, you know, He's uh, started his family. Uh, how old is Aiden? Is he five? He is five. Yeah. Three kids, five and under, which is probably, in my experience, the most exhausting season. <laughs> old enough to really help, and they all need a lot from mom and dad both. So mm. it's not an easy season to be in. Um, mm. So, friends, what questions do you have for Kyle in his whole experience process of being apprenticed uh, to mm. this stage and and uh, of course, we obviously have more desire about the coming years. 
Okay, well, I can't help myself because I'm female. So I'd like to talk about this other person that you was apprenticed at the same time as you and get a report on her because mm -hmm. for for a lot of the people that we're going to apprentice their moms with kids like your wife mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. people that um, you know everybody can't work for no no pay so they mm -hmm. might be uh, taking on a big role at church but it's a big sacrifice for the family of you know time and finances so I guess I'd like to hear a little bit if you guys could talk about some of the women that you've uh, apprenticed. That is great. Uh, I mean, that's like five or six whole great questions, Gail. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I can, I feel like Keith, maybe you should speak from the, what it, you know, what it looks like to apprentice. And then yeah. if there's anything I could fill in with the, you know, my, my experience of, of Laura, you know, serving and, and uh, working alongside of her. Yeah, I, I, because I wholeheartedly believe this cohort apprentice role is, is really important, it also makes it possible for me to not spend a whole lot of time one-on-one -on -one alone with one of my female leaders, but everybody's in a group together. Um, and at the time, while Kyle was talking about him and Laura as being lay missionaries at the one congregation, we'd actually commissioned uh, uh, lay missionaries for the other congregations as well in, the, in a, a fall festival event together. And so there were four or five lay missioners that were commissioned together. Um, and, uh, and I met with them all together. Um, and so Laura was extremely gifted and talented. She unfortunately discerned uh, with her husband a new job for her husband in Texas. And they moved. Um, which brought her role in our church obviously to an end, but not out of any kind of lack of uh, giftedness or um, what I think is a, a, a genuine calling that she has. She's gotten involved with an Anglican church, her and her husband in, uh, in uh, Houston, Texas, Mission uh, Missio Dei, led by Father Mark Ball. Um, and so, uh, it was really, really sad to lose her because she was also musically gifted. She was also artistically gifted. Um, and she was a heck of a preacher. And she grew up in a family that believed strongly that women shouldn't preach. Um, and so it was a real, you know, growing in her calling and identity. E and even though that, that sort of women shouldn't preach um, kind of emphasis was part of her family life. It was kind of, it was really healing for her. Um, and so uh, that was wonderful and phenomenal, but every individual has restrictions or restraints on their time and what they can do. And you can't pay every volunteer in the church. So you have to figure out with your budget, with your rector, what are the, um, what roles do you stipend and what roles do you not stipend? For greenhouse, We've made it possible for people to raise support. So it's actually increased the number of people who could be compensated um, for their different roles. So right now, our, we have a sexton in the church. He's a young man <coughs> who unfortunately isn't extremely gifted, but he cleans the church and he raised money to do it. He has people supporting his ministry while he cleans our church. And so while not every role can raise support well, um, you know, it, it's been a blessing to us. It has uh, significantly helped our church budget and our, the, the maintenance of our space. So um, there's no like one size fits all formula for who you compensate and who you don't. Um, as long as people are bivocational, the scheduling is a challenge and bivocational leaders always feel a little left out. Always. It's just, it comes with the territory. Um, bivocational people can't meet during the normal work hours like full-time mission staff can. Anybody who's employed full-time by the church or is a missionary can meet at any time and are available for all the meetings. 
but those that are bivocational or stay at home moms or have a lot of commitments um, and they're doing, you know, five to 10 hours a week for the church, they're just less available for those meetings that help people feel connected. So it's a constant tension in the life of the church and for these folks, Gail. Um, and every situation has to be discerned what's going to help. Sometimes you have to figure out you know, when you can meet and it's not going to be an ideal time to try to keep people feeling connected. Um, I don't know if that answered all your questions, Gail. Thank you. I forgot the rest of them, so we're all good. <laughs> were you going to add anything to that, Kyle? No, I, maybe not add like um, a couple things, which is first, I think that Bible or bivocational, I've heard people call it co-vocational because it's just trying to orient your sort of life situation in such a way that ministry has a substantial part in it. So whether that other co-vocation part is stay-at-home mom, like Keith said, or whether it's a bivocational thing like I was doing with uh, a nonprofit, which frankly, I was, the other piece for me was I was traveling quite a bit for that. And so Keith and I had to be in quite a bit of communication to work out the particulars of what I was and wasn't going to own in my lay pastor role. And so in some ways, it's sort of like the constraints probably that some, you know, just people who have more on their plate lifestyles, moms and others um, would have would have felt like in that situation to some degree. The other thing I would say too, is that uh, reflecting back on Laura um, also in our experience, the other thing that's just to underline is that she was really gifted. And so I, you know, like there was a wonderful sort of, um, at least for me, it was kind of give and take and friendship of us doing it together kind of thing that was there um, in the congregation. And uh, she and her husband are still friends of ours as well, uh, Natalie and mine. And so um, uh, that actually was, a, a it was, um, how do I say this? It was, it was fun for me to actually have a co-laborer in a similar stage like that. Um, and so anyway, just kind of in reflecting back on, on that and my experience with that. That's great. Go ahead, John. A uh, question about deployment. At, at what point and uh, where uh, do you, uh, Kyle, uh, think you might go? Well, the most immediate answer is, uh, it, so again, there's like, there are pieces we're discerning, but might be right here in the backyard. It, 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 the staying in Portage Park and taking on the, is that what you're asking? The kind of the next role from here sort of thing? Um, more, more of a general question because I've got a friend sure. there, Adam Gosnell, who came through uh, the Green mm. House program and he's now, mm -hmm. where is he now? Uh, he's, he's with there. us. He's at we know Adam Gosnell. He's at, uh, with us. Is he there? Uh, yeah. Uh, he was somewhere else though, right? And he's back there now. Is that right? Well, he was uh, in Texas. On the geography. But uh, so uh, the plan is to recruit, to apprentice, and to deploy. Is it not to uh, serve the nation uh, out, of, out of the greenhouse? Is that right? Oh. So you're asking a question more about kind of where do we imagine God maybe leading us to deploy from Chicago elsewhere next? Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. I mean, Keith, you probably have a better sense for that than, than I do at this point. Do you have any thoughts on that? So I'm not sure I understand where we might send people from our church outward. No, not from your church, but from the greenhouse program. Is that not a thing? Yeah, greenhouse is all over the United States. So um, most recently, we took a lay missioner in our church, Chandler Wiley, and we sent him to Phoenix, Arizona. Right. Yeah. And now he's working uh, to raise up a church in Maricopa. So greenhouse is in, um, I don't know, eight or 10 dioceses right now. Um, and so, uh, we, we just support as people, uh, do their work, their mission work. Um, we provide a, a, a method, a way for people to raise support for their ministry. Um, so there's, there's really no limit. Well, yeah. So, Can I, oh. it's not centralized. It, it, it is, uh, in various locations. Is that right? Where yeah. We have mission staff in, in various places. locations and regional leaders in nine or 10 dioceses. Yeah. 
Well, can I add on to that too? So sometimes with that, John, um, so we did, there was a sending out of Chandler into Arizona, but sometimes it's also, uh, um, sometimes people approach us, and this is kind of what Keith was saying, but just to add a little more context to it, sometimes people will approach us and they've sensed the Holy Spirit moving in a certain place and the desire to start a congregation somewhere starts to foment and we can come alongside of that and help sort of give them some, uh, uh, you know, um, what would you say? Like a, a, a vision for what that could look like to multiply in that place with the, the congregation and form the congregation that might be in a given, given place. And so, um, yeah, I don't, so like even uh, right now um, for me, I'm, there's some people that are connected with the University of Chicago here in the city and I'm friends with some of them and they are sort of, um, I, we're trying to discern together, is there some next step that God might have for some new work happening there, right? And it's not necessarily we're sending someone out. It's more like I am sort of connected to what they're doing and trying to help discern with them and give shape to the possibility of a congregation beginning uh, in the future there kind of thing. So um, it's not a system, it's more organic, um, depending on the situation. Is that fair to say? That's very fair to say. Yep. Good. Yeah. Thank you. And, and every scenario is unique. So right now, Kyle is leading a team of lay missionaries. One is trying to reach college campus and one is trying to serve those in a nursing home. And both have been hugely impacted by COVID. Um, the campus doesn't have any freshmen or sophomores on campus. They're all virtual and the nursing home has been shut down since March with no one allowed to come in and residents have been in their rooms, room bound since the very beginning. Um, and so it's, it, it's been particularly challenging and it's been wonderful for me to watch Kyle as he has even led in this scenario that, that uh, I have never seen a seminary course prepare us for. Um, nothing has prepared us for this last year, for the last 12 months. And so we've had to get creative and come up with crazy ideas and do really terrible jobs with live streaming um, to try to continue to bring the gospel um, to various folks. And with these lay missionaries who have said, sign me up, I want to do this, um, how to help resource them when they hit the wall and they don't know what to do, which this year has been a lot of that. Yeah. Can I actually jump in on that too, Keith? Because I want to say something. I want these guys to hear this too, like of, about you. I think one of the things that I've, Keith is a fantastic mentor. And I think one of the things that marks his mentorship is creating a space of, uh, well, one, a space of trusting you early with whatever he hands off, he really trusts you with. So there's not a ton of micromanaging from Keith and you're not feeling like all the time, oh, is he gonna, you know, am I doing this right? Is he gonna, you know, swoop in or whatever? He, he's so good about, about giving you room to kind of give it a try. And then if you give it a try and succeed, he's the first one to say, awesome, you did so well at that. And if you fail, you, he's the last one to berate you, right? For it, he it really is a gracious space to try things and fail. And he's really good at being able to live in that space and be okay with people taking chances and not getting it quite right. And uh, I think that for me at least has created a really safe place to grow in my leadership in our parish. And uh, so anyway, Keith, for you, thank you for, for the way you model that and uh, have, have done that for me, so. Thanks, Kyle. Um, it's almost as if I brought you on here just to say nice things about me. No, <laughs> <laughs> it goes both ways. It goes both ways. <laughs> um, other questions, you guys. Um, Father Keith and, uh, and Kyle, um, I'm trying to formulate a question, but you just said something that sparked things in my mind about, um, doing the live streaming poorly, you know, because we weren't prepared to do this for COVID. So, so um, I, I want to explain this, what I'm going to say in context and, and see if one, you agree, and two, if you have any comments on it. 
Um, one of the things I think that holds people back is um, they, they don't really think they can do it very well. And one of the things I believe in certain contexts is anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. Amen, Ken and David, amen. And E.K. Chesterton it, was a great help on this, wasn't he? Yeah, so I'm just wondering, um, you know, to give ourselves permission to try stuff and, and fail and other people to try stuff and fail seems to me a really important part of apprenticing. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, the only reason and, and way that we can say we did live streaming poorly is because we've gotten better. And we can look back and be like, that was embarrassing. We weren't even, we didn't even know to be embarrassed. Uh, but here we are a year later and we've learned so many things that we can look back at, a, at the first live streaming attempts uh, that we did as a church and say, that is terrible. Um, but we didn't know it at the time. Um, we were just doing what we knew to do. And uh, so um, you, you can't even really critique yourself until you've gotten farther down. And that obviously means you've gotten a lot better at it. So the, this is this is like, this is something that my boss is trying to help me figure out how to articulate. But I view everything we do in ministry as a draft. Yeah. Everything. I think of like, if you think about the, the research paper you're supposed to do in college, um, like everything we're doing is, is either the first draft, if it's the first time we attempted it, or it's like the sixth draft, but we're never done with our drafts because there's this lovely thing called the liturgical calendar and the same events keep coming back around <laughs> and you're going to lead a Christmas Eve, maybe depending on how old you are, another 20 times, another 30 times. And so every single one is a draft. And we have to think of everything we're doing as, as a draft, as yet another draft. And my only hope is that this year's draft is a little better than last year's draft. Um, I don't need it to be perfect. I don't need it to be flawless. I just want it to be a little better than last year's to get that ball further down the field somehow. If all of life was one football run, like I just want each year to be a little further down the field instead of going backwards. Um, so Gretchen, you look like you wanted to say well, something. Well, I agree with Ken and David. Uh, our first live streaming was pretty awful. Uh, and we only did it because we wanted to get church to everybody and we've improved so much. But the Amen. blessing in it is if we hadn't had to, we would not be doing it. And now we're doing morning prayer and Compline almost every day of the week. We do our Bible study through that. And uh, we've bought more equipment as we can, and we're getting lots better. But I, I'm quite sure we would never have done it if we hadn't been forced. Amen, like, Gretchen. And so it's wonderful. As yeah. you say, you get better every time. There is a comparison between the pandemic and what it's done to the church and, and to compare that to the diaspora and what that did to the church. Because people literally were dispersed to their homes and had to figure out how to do what we did. And so the diaspora forced innovation in the church. Um, it forced um, the church to figure out how to um, adapt to new cultures and new laws um, as they found themselves in new locations, how to gather. Um, and we did this, the, the same astronomical innovation took place this last year in the last 12 months and and we all believe the church will never be the same again right we've we've learned some things that we'll probably never go back and stop doing um i think the church got a lot more pastoral in the last year the personal touch became a lot more valuable um, because everybody was so alone and isolated and so um I, I absolutely agree with you, Gretchen. It takes humility to learn new things instead of just saying, well, we can't do it the way we've always been doing it, so we're just not going to do it anymore. Um, it takes humility to try to learn a new technology or learn a new um, method. So great. We have um, Kyle for 10 more minutes. So is there anything else you want to know from Kyle? Um, and what he's experienced. Like, 
Kyle, did you ever mess up really, really bad? Um, and what was that like? I, I, I didn't mean to have you answer that. I was just giving examples for you guys to ask him. So Kyle, I don't know how to even answer, ask this question, but you kept referring both of you about apprenticeship has to be safe, has mm -hmm. to be safe, a safe environment. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Can you speak to that? I don't, I don't know uh, how, I don't know. I just think it's really key because as soon as you step out, you get nailed. If it isn't safe, you may not be able to get up again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think that there are two sort of, um, two ways in which, well, two levels, maybe two levels of that safety that I've found helpful. One is the on the leadership within the kind of like, core leadership of the church. And so beginning with the rector and going on to other priests or deacons and clergy, other lay missioners that are involved uh, in your context, um, to be able to have a high level of trust together um, is important. And trust in terms of, um, you know, being able to confide in one another, but also trust in terms of being able to receive each other's gifts and our shortcomings on the team. And uh, so really building that team dynamic, if you have multiple people that are in kind of a that level of leadership together um, is really crucial. And so for us in a parish multiple congregations, that's also can both be within a particular congregation as well as the leaders of the multiple congregations um, as well to have that kind of uh, trust among each other is really important. And a, a, a choice that you make together to say, I am, I'm going to, I'm going to be the kind of teammate that is willing to receive your risk and let you make mistakes. I, you know, uh, to, to choose that together is, is important. Um, I think the second level then is also the congregational level. And so we're, I feel blessed that in our congregation, we have a pretty grace-oriented culture. Uh, uh, the disposition of a lot of our folks is pretty like, um, I, I don't find a lot of criticism, backbiting, at least not directly to me. <laughs> Maybe it's happening and they're just not, you bring it forward to Keith and me, but we're, we're, we, I feel blessed that in our context on that level as well, there's a trust and there's kind of an expectation that we are uh, willing to sort of, uh, we're in it together, we're willing to be, scrappy, make mistakes, you know, that kind of thing, as long as we are ultimately oriented toward what's most important, which is loving God, loving each other well, and trying to, to, uh, to grow uh, both individually and collectively uh, into the kingdom, right? Like, I mean, that's ultimately what, um, what we want to be about. So, so that kind of trust and that safety on both levels has been really crucial, I think, for me. Go ahead, John. Question. Uh, I'm in my ninth decade here on earth. And uh, I'm Praise very interested because Kyle, I'm, I'm looking at you, you're probably in your third or fourth at the, at the most. And I'm wondering about your, your group, your crew. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there much enthusiasm for them to follow uh, the track that you are on? Uh, among your mm -hmm. friends generally, um, where, where, where is faith today among the millennials? <laughs> oh my um do we have another hour uh no i um that's a great question uh kyle we actually do have another hour but i didn't want to presume on your <laughs> <laughs> no 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 uh, well then i'll i'll uh, i'll start the answer and you guys can hash it out in the next hour if you want um so i think gosh Man, that's a really good question, John. I think there are, so one of the, the strengths of the millennial cohort is that millennials tend to, if you've looked at Barna and some other research that's come out, um, there's a desire for authenticity uh, in the millennial cohort. And there's a desire to do something with your life that is meaningful, that is sort of, you know, the world changery mentality. And both those things can go, awry 
also, but like, I think that both of those um, features of the millennial cohort actually create the conditions for an openness to the church, can create conditions of openness to the church. And so, you know, I, some of the most sort of, I, I feel among some of my friends um, that are also in ministry, a pretty, uh, the, the, what? We love the church warts and all, right? Like the kind of cynicism around the church that is, I think, uh, uh, in some ways because of falls of leaders that we can all think of or sort of uh, the church's deafness to certain things, perhaps in different times and situations, we could be cynical. But I think that for the people that I know that are in ministry, my friends in ministry, there's a pretty like, um, we're still all in, you know, Uh, we're still all in on the church. And so that gives me a lot of encouragement and then as far as, you know, if you're asking the question of like, what about the non-believing millennial? I think, um, I think there is a lot of, of uh, skepticism around organized religion. Um, but I also think that the narrative that you hear in the media or kind of other things is maybe not, it, it's more complicated, right? The, the rise of the nuns and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that the spiritual journey for millennials is a little more complicated than that. And so I think in some ways um, we're still learning uh, how, what, how to connect, what it means to connect to my generation best. Um, and we're trying to do that. We've got a lot, lot of young families in our church. I, our church is composed mostly of people in my age cohort, actually. Um, and so um, that's, that gives me hope uh, as well in an urban environment. So. First two things you said, can we take those to the bank that they, uh, millennials, your, your crew, uh, believers and non-believers want to be world changers and they want to be relevant. Um, and there's no better place to do it than for, from, from what we, we can see, those who've gone before you, than in the church. Um, so is there some good, is there, is there a reason for hope that uh, more and more will be drawn as it, as as you become a good example for them, for instance, will they be drawn to you? Will you be recruiting the next apprentices uh, from even from non-believers to come all the way through unto salvation and then into the ministry? Lord willing, by the grace of God, that's what I want. You know, that's what I want. Not a fair question when you only got two minutes left, but uh, <laughs> it's one of my heart is to, to uh, yeah. reach. Yeah, thanks, John. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask Kyle, um, what if any role, what what role did, if any, uh, celebration play in uh, your being apprenticed and the safe environment you experienced? Celebration? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. In terms of like, yeah, celebrating our uh, both sort of wins, if you will, as a church, and then wins individually, like in leadership kind of thing. Yeah, super important. You can't, yeah, no, that's that's a great point. You can't, uh, it goes back to the affirmation piece on a certain level. Celebration is a public form of affirmation of something that you've seen God do in your church or something that you've seen God do through someone's leadership. And so if you don't pause to celebrate it, yeah, you die on the vine. <laughs> so it's super important to have a culture of celebrating together um, and not just not just like what you're doing, but also celebrating birthdays or celebrating, you know, just like uh, of, of having a, yeah, uh, n- re- noticing each other and celebrating each other and your gifts and your milestones and uh, uh, yeah, all those kinds of things. So um, David's got a question, but I wanted to just wrap up your answer there. How many times a year does the team that you work with celebrate together? Oh, man. I don't know. That's a lot. <laughs> I mean, we have one annual celebration that we do for our church every year. We make sure to have a specific set aside time to look back on the previous year to give thanks for everything we've seen God do in the past year. And it was a blessing to do that with the last year. It really made us feel, like realize, yes, there was a pandemic, but boy, was God moving in our midst in the last year. So it happens annually in a congregation-wide and team-wide way. But then I don't know, Keith. I mean, we're, I feel like it looks different in different contexts, but 
fairly regularly, I would say, wouldn't you? Like, <laughs> kind of all the time? Is that the, I mean, that's kind of how I want to frame it. We do like an annual staff fun day where we all go that's true. Out a work day having fun. We do a mm -hmm. summer retreat as a staff team together um, and have a lot of fun on that um, as well. And then we just try to find those uh, brief moments throughout the year to celebrate for any reason. Um, we're just always looking for a reason to celebrate. Um, <laughs> Because I believe celebration is a big part of apprenticing, not just mm -hmm. an individual, but a whole, a whole group of apprentices. So, mm -hmm. uh, Ken and David, what did you want to ask before we let Kyle go? So, um, so Kyle, are you still working for Veritas Forum? That wasn't clear to me. Great question. Thanks for clarifying that. No, I'm not. So when I um, I served there for two years that almost roughly corresponded with the first two years of my uh, lay missioner role. Um, and so then I made the decision after the after those two years to step full time into ministry with Greenhouse and raise support and come onto the staff team of our parish and multiple congregations as a location pastor for um, the Portage Park uh, congregation here in the neighborhood. So he's he's full time. Oh, David froze. Um, so he's full time uh, in ministry, raised support, but each year the congregation is increasing the amount it gives towards Kyle's mm -hmm. mission account and the amount that he needs from individual donors, uh, God willing, shrinks each year. So the same for me, actually. I still have a handful of individual donors that support me as the congregation's support to me has increased over the years, I raised support seven years ago um, and still have some individual donors supporting me, so. Um, I know what Veritas Forum is. Could you take 30 seconds and explain it to the others who may not? Yeah, absolutely, thanks. Um, so Veritas Forum I, is a great organization that is um, working on college campuses throughout the country. So some of you may actually know of Veritas from uh, colleges that may be near you. Um, and what they do is they host events, primarily host events, um, that um, engage usually a Christian with a non-Christian, uh, often a professor from a university uh, to represent both sides, and to just explore life's big questions. Things like, can a rational person believe God exists? Or what do you do about the problem of suffering? Or um, different things that are like that. And you invite the campus community to come and be part of those uh, conversations so that students can kind of reflect together about those questions. And so, um, so it was a great experience for me. And I got to know a lot of folks from a lot of different places serving in that way. And uh, that's how I actually got connected to the University of Chicago folks was through hosting forums at the University of Chicago. And I've maintained those friendships into the present. So. Yeah, he even did one, uh, John, in uh, at ASU um, with uh, Ben Sanders. Yeah, Ben Sanders. He is wonderful. You're muted. Sorry, John. Yeah, Ben's a great, great friend. We actually put together a program called the Warrior Class to help uh, train up high school seniors getting ready to attend college. And oh, ben nice. Speakers and was very Great guy. Yeah, Ben's a good friend. Yeah. Um, I helped him start the conference on faith and science that they have done at Arizona State. So I was part of that team for that. So, yeah. And I hope you'll say hello to Adam for me. You got oh, it. Oh, we definitely will. All right. Thank you so much, Kyle, for your time. I'll let you go to your family and help put the kids to bed. That sounds great. Well, blessings to everybody. I hope you keep enjoying this time uh, with Father Keith. Good to meet you all. Thank you. Bless you. So I've had a lot of lay missioners or apprentices over the years. He was the one that had the most leadership gifting out of all the others. Um, and so um, one of the other things to, to remember is that sometimes the person you choose uh, may, be, uh, may not turn out the way you want them to. Um, and so I've, I've had a lot... The more lay missioners or apprentices that you have, the more over time you see the ones that really rise and succeed and those that um, for one reason or another don't do as well, um, just based on gifting and calling or perhaps their character. 
Um, Kyle has an exemplary character and is probably the most gifted leader out of all so far. I, I've identified that there are two kinds of leadership gifts. One is a first chair leadership gift where they can lead something by themselves and spearhead it. And the other is the second chair leadership gift where they do really well when they're partnered with a stronger leader, you know, like a, like a right arm. They, they're a really gifted right arm to a good leader. Um, and I've raised up quite a few second chair leaders and Kyle's probably my first, first chair leader that I've raised up that I really love working with, which is why we're discerning transitioning the lead pastor role from me to him um, in the coming years. Um, I think he's really gifted and uh, he, can, he can fulfill that role moving forward. So um, any takeaways from that, that time with Kyle that you wanted to share? I would say very hopeful. Uh, what a blessing to see. And Adam Gosnell uh, as well, Chan Chandler Wiley, um, we're seeing fruit from the, uh, from the program. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, John. I'm trying to read some people we apprentice surpass us in ministry effectiveness. That is the hope that we all have. Um, it's just like raising kids. You want your kids to grow up to be better adults than, than we are. That's really what we want for them. Um, we don't want them to have more than we had. We want them to grow up to be better people. Um, and, and, you know, in, in some cases, we want them to surpass us in our fields, um, musically, artistically, academically, um, in, in ministry. We just want them to surpass us. And it's the same for apprentices. Um, we should not be insecure and not want the apprentices to show or demonstrate that they are even more gifted than we are. Like that is something to celebrate, not to be afraid of. Um, and it's only insecurity that would cause us to be afraid or to hold back someone. Um, I, I don't want us to be pastors who feel threatened by gifted individuals. Um, we're not going to lose our jobs. We're going to multiply uh, the work in the kingdom of God. And so insecurity is definitely something to keep an eye on in ourselves um, as we apprentice others and raise them up. So my schedule says that we'll, we can do some large group discussion between now and um, uh, my time, 6.30, your time, 5.30 or 4.30. And then we'll end with a 30 minute concluding small group time. Um, I believe that's uh, when the, the program ends. Although you guys have probably been on Zoom a long time. Am I right? You guys are probably really tired. I have an interloper um, uh, behind me. I'm, I'm sorry about that. So um, questions. Um, I'd love to know what you guys identified in your last small group as um, fears that people have, the greatest fears that keep people from getting involved in ministry. Um, what did you guys identify as the fears that keep people from getting involved? Not worthy. That they're not worthy. They're I'm not too shy. Worthy. Yeah, shy is good. There can be a false impression that, that the, the deacons are definitely worthy and that normal people aren't worthy. But it's, it's a misunderstanding, right? Um, because if you're like me, you don't feel any more worthy uh, as you press in and get closer to the Lord. Who's this Another was I don't behind you here. This is Michael, my five-year-old. Hello, Michael. He's excited about being a big brother in April. Wow. So, he should be. Yep. Yeah. So he's got no uh, fear of the camera. <laughs> yeah, he, he's a bit of a show off. He loves to uh, Hello, Michael. draw attention. So do you want to say hi? No. All right. So um, other fears, not worthy and shy. What else? Not ready or feel, don't feel equipped. Yeah, uh, not equipped. It's a good one. Uh, the fear that uh, 
the devil wants to put in us, whether we recognize where it's coming from or not. That uh, and and it, it gets to worthy, it gets to uh, preparedness, but also gets to uh, fear of rejection and and um, and you know, kind of the how dare you, you 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 are uh, stepping into an area that you don't belong, which I think the enemy wants to tell us a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's good, John. What other fears keep people from getting involved in ministry? Commitment of time or yes. um, or what's it going to cost me? Excellent. Is there a fear of bait and switch? I'll say yes to one thing, but then I'll get asked to do something totally different. Oh, yes. Yes, we call that foot in the door technique around here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a slippery slope you know uh, if i say yes to one thing it'll be a, a bunch of things coming right after that and i've heard it's somebody else's turn yeah i've done it for years it's somebody else's turn. yeah have you I've, had I've also heard people talk about well if i do it it's going to be lifelong i'll never get out get away from it never get oh, out wow. Yeah. So that's the perception of certain needs in the church being like black holes. Like you just can't extract yourself. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. I guess that goes along with what people have said to me is I don't want to lose my freedom. Yeah. To go and come and do whatever I want when I want. Yeah. But I don't think we're supposed to live that way anyway. <laughs> but Me neither. Yeah. And, and most people, they want meaning in their life. So there is a, a bit of a, uh, a toss up between freedom and responsibility. Um, but ultimately, the question is do they want to grow in any way in their lives? Um, everything that we invite people into should be about helping them grow, not about getting our needs at the church fulfilled. It's got to be people oriented, not task oriented. I think because after a history of the church being task oriented, we just need a warm body. We don't really care who's. Uh, people have uh, lost inspiration, lost interest. But if we can turn our methods into people orientation, I want to invest in you and I want to help you become who you were made to be, learn some new skills, um, grow in the calling God's call that God has for you. That will result in, I, I believe, um, a more open and willing Yes. Um, I, I think it's also important to give people opportunity to exit. Um, like when people say they can't do it anymore or they need a break, we got to like bless that right away. First response, bless it. Um, uh, now it needs to be done in a responsible way. Not I'm late for Sunday and 10 minutes into the service, I call you and say, I'd like out of the job I was supposed to do. 10 minutes ago, that's not cool. But like a conversation, hey, I'm, I'm feeling overwhelmed. My mom is sick and in the hospital. I need to spend more time with the family right now. Bless it. Um, loosen or fully release the individual from their responsibilities. They'll come back much more willingly um, in a few weeks or a few months and do even more because you've built trust. They feel safe. They can get in and out of ministry quickly. Those are all really great. I have one, one not about what's well, on that line of thinking. When I would, after I was ordained, I knew that the bishop would like me to serve at another church. And the priest that I ended up getting deployed to, um, he said to me, Gail, I care more about your walk with God than anything you do here. Yes. That was the best thing he could have said to me. That's exactly right. 
That's exactly right. All of this ministry work, it's relationships. It's being cared for and not feeling like you're being taken advantage of. If you feel taken advantage of, you're probably going to make your apprentices feel taken advantage of. Um, we just don't want to do that. So I'm so glad you had a rector who said that to you, Gail. I'm just going to say it was Father Tim at Branches for all of you who are wondering. That's great. So you felt really cared for as an individual, not seen as just another one of the queen's worker bees. Yeah, that's terrific. What, what else do you think keeps people from saying yes to your invitation? Maybe, maybe just sometimes it comes down to we, what you were saying earlier is we need to observe and discern. And I think quieter, less uh, overt people can be overlooked. So they're not asked. That's absolutely right. It's because we, we fail to recognize, right? So that's a great comment, observation. Somebody else was trying to speak at the same moment. Who was that? Um, it, it was me, Father Keith. Uh, <coughs> what the, the book that Deacon Gale recommended for our staff to read uh, for Lent, um, the, uh, the author was talking about three, three things that keep us from uh, following the, the lead of the spirit. And they were fear, um, illusions, obviously false illusions. But the third one was the one I want to share that really got me because I never would have thought, he said, inertia. Um, inertia. Inertia just, you know, inertia is, uh, is not just an object in motion, tends to stay in motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. And so we're just used to, some people are just used to, and it's inertia. It's not, not anything else, really. Yeah, um, that's a great observation. And that's where I would also, again, emphasize that book, the volunteer revolution. If you want to break someone's inertia of rest, you have got to make your ask the best ask you can make it, which means you need to learn all the things that should be said and all of the things that should not be said. <clears throat> and Bill Hybels, he recommends that if you're going to ask somebody into a significant role, like apprentice, lay missioner, you know, any role like that, it's got to be a face-to-face -face meeting where you spend the first part of that meeting telling them how wonderful they are and how much they've blessed you and what you've, how you've seen God in them mm -hmm. and in their, in, in their life. And then you, you, you cast the vision for what you think they could do. Um, that book will, will inspire you um, because it shares a lot of personal stories of people who have been invited into something that changed their life, just like the disciples, just like the apostles were. Uh, and so you can't, you can't ask someone uh, to, to step into a role via text or an email or, you know what I mean? Like you, you've got to, there's a, there's a rate of positive response based on the method you use to ask people to do things. The highest rate of return is face-to-face. -face. The lowest rate of return is a written a message. And so um, if you can't see them face-to-face, -face, you got to at least do some kind of audio, video, phone call. Um, so, you know, if it's really important, they get a face-to-face -face ask. Uh, invite them to partner with you. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to add uh, before we go to the small groups, and that is how important chemistry is. People like to, they like to say yes and, and make a sacrifice of their time when they enjoy being with people. That, <clears throat> that's part of the asking. So if your personality doesn't connect with somebody else's personality, it's probably not the best ask. You want to 
invite people to come alongside you that you love to be with. I mean, it is kind of a qualification for you to like them. If you don't like people, we're not called to like everybody. We're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're not called to like everybody. It's okay to have people in the church that you don't like. Don't ask them to work with you. <laughs> ask the people you like to work with you. Um, if you drive to the church and you see their car in the parking lot, does it make you happy or does it make you reluctant? That tells you whether that's the kind of person you should ask to work with you. Chemistry is so important for the kinds of, I don't know, sharing of your hearts <coughs> that needs to happen. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Chemistry has become more and more important in, in decisions I make to hire people. I have to enjoy them um, in order to want to work with them 40 hours a week. Um, and it's dreadful to think about hiring someone whose personality just grates against your personality or someone who has a personality like a tree stump. You just like, you can't connect no matter how hard you try, um, you know? And there are a few people like that in my life. And I just, it's unbearable thinking about working with them. So, um, <clears throat> so those are, are some important values in terms of who you look for and what you're looking for when you invite people uh, to work alongside you. So you Do don't it, recommend a tree stump I, ministry, is that it? Say again? You don't recommend a tree stump ministry. I really don't. And tree you stump. know, <laughs> we, we have this one missioner who works with us and he just has the affect of, um, he has no affect. I don't know if you've met people like that. Yes, definitely have. Hard to connect with people who have no affect. They Good just don't player. do anything. Don't smile when you smile at them. Don't greet you warmly. Uh, it's just hard. So yeah, um, they, they may have a place somewhere, John, but my personality doesn't work really well with them. So I don't recruit very many of them. They'd be good at a poker table. They, they would be great at a poker <laughs> ministry. That's right. Um, which, you know, uh, John Jordan, that's, that's your territory, right? Vegas? Get some good poker ministry going? Well, I don't even know how to play it. Yeah. Uh, the, best, the best one around here is Texas Hold'em. And um, I don't know anything about it. I Sometimes I wished I did, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. John, God bless you. You're so sweet. Um, have any of you had a bad apprenticing relationship? Gail's like, maybe. Ken and David has. Do you want to share a brief word about it, either of you? They're both staring each other down. Yeah, not not really, but it was it was someone, it was, and I'm not saying this is the only one, but the first one that came to mind. Um, and it was a long time ago. It was over 20 years ago. And it was it was a relationship where I I didn't I didn't call the person on stuff I should have early on. I kind of let things slide. And so our relationship got more and more dishonest. And, and that, yeah. you know, and that, that was not a good, and it did not end well. Um, and, and, you know, at least half of that was mine because I, I, early on when I began to sense that this person had a hard time telling the truth, I should have, I should have dealt with it, but it was just easier to let it slide. And small things become medium things, become large things. And one Sunday, he just didn't show up. Yeah. Would you say, uh, Ken and David, that knowing your style of working through conflict would be important in this area? Uh, absolutely. And, and I've learned a lot since then about working through conflict. But, um, but part of it, I, I was in a very conflicted ministry where <laughs> there was a lot of conflict and it's like, do I want to take another one on in this guy kind of yeah. thing? Yeah, it was conflict fatigue in some yep. way. And uh, 
Um, but definitely knowing knowing how to how to speak truth to people lovingly is really important, I think, in apprenticing. And, and oh. to do it early in the relationship when something comes up and not let it build up. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. I imagine our bishops all have conflict fatigue because it's just that that's that's part of the job for them is constantly working through conflict. Gail, did you want to describe briefly a difficult apprentice relationship you had? Yeah, well, th this just is going to make your point for you, Father Keith, because I didn't get to choose the three people, four people. Like, um, it was I worked for this huge church, and it's not it wasn't Anglican, but um, I was I was their coordinator, regional person for the southwest of the USA, and and the the pastors of this church were like rock star almost level, you know, because it was a huge revival. So the, um, the people, they said, gather a team. Well, that was easy for me to do for the people in Southern California that I could have a relationship with and know. But then they said, well, these are people that, you know, you might want to consider in Northern California. And I did a couple of events up there and I, I tried to mentor this gal and she was older than me. I think, first of all, she just dismissed me because I was younger, but, but then you feel like when you're Christian, you don't want to say something's wrong with somebody, but I knew right away she was more in it for the meeting, the, the pastors, the big pastors that might come through for this event than she wasn't actually ministering to the people that came. And I didn't yeah. quite know how to get out of it or get around it until finally they offered me, a, the ministry I worked for offered me like, well, have these, these three people give a a talk and give them the exact time of the talk and tell them what you want them to speak about. Just give their testimony or whatever. And she screwed it up so badly. It gave me a good way to kind of get her off. I still encourage her. I said, you know, work on it or whatever. I gave her pointers, but I really didn't want her because her character wasn't right for this. She wasn't about the people she was supposed to be loving the regular people. She was more about getting a position to where she could reach to these rock star leaders. Yeah. And oh. yeah. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a character issue, but also the fact that she didn't respect you no, um, or value you just makes it really hard. So when people co come to be apprenticed by us, if they don't feel valued by us, um, they're not going to stay in it, nor are we if we feel like I have an apprentice who's not teachable, right? If you apprentice anybody in their 20s, it's, there's, a, there's a strong likelihood that they think they know how to do it better than you. It just kind of comes with the 20 year old. Um, it it kind of comes with that, that arena and they have to make several mistakes to realize they actually don't know more than you. Um, and you have to be patient enough to get through that. But if they over time just continue to persist in not being teachable, it's, it's impossible to work with them long-term. Um, I'll give a few young leaders a few chances to to prove that they can be teachable, but I, I don't, I don't have all the time in the world to give to people who aren't going to learn from me. So I do want to pick and choose who they're going to be. But some of you may be in situations where you, you really can only take the people who say who are willing. And uh, there, there may not be a large number of people to choose from. And so, you know, figuring out what you're willing to work with, who you're willing to work with is really important. Um, but I would say, you, you know, your time is, is as valuable as anybody else's. So if somebody is not worth your time in this, in this level of investment, um, to Ken and David's point, it's better to end that instead of drag it out, avoiding the conflict for months or however long it went on, Ken and David, would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah put that relationship out of its misery. Um, so, well, as you guys go to the final small groups, uh, you don't have to, well, uh, here, here's the assignment for the small group. It's, it's um, you talked about dreams you have in your own heart and fears that people have for getting involved in ministry. The other two questions I would like you to respond to, one, what remedies could you give 
that would dispel the fear that people have to getting involved in ministry? Like, how would you adjust anything? It could be what you adjust or even the whole church culture. What would you adjust that would dispel the fear that they have? And then the second question, list some of the fears that pastors have, deacons have, in allowing others to be included in ministry. What are some of the fears that you might have in releasing ministry responsibility to your apprentices or to others? Do you have those two questions? Great. I feel like we lost a person. Did we lose someone? Because right now, the Deanne and Steve small group doesn't have a third. I believe Gretchen, Gretchen. dropped out. Gretchen? Yeah. Oh, Gretchen. Okay. Well, Ken and David, I'll leave it to you to fuss at her if you need to. And then um, the, the, the time is supposed to end in just a half hour from now, from my understanding of the schedule. Is that right, Ken and David? That, that, that is. Um, I, I'm just, I'm going to ask you if you want us to come back or can we pray for one another in, in those groups and then disperse? My